Hello, I'm Aga from Arvis Artist, and today I explain V-Ray Render settings. Are you with me? Let's begin! Render settings are not going to make your images outstanding. You won't find this magic button that will make your images beautiful. If you don't understand the idea how to create images in 3D, settings don't do images for you. However, they can improve rendering time and the quality of the images. So after you gain the knowledge about 3D art, it's a good idea to learn more about render settings. So let's learn about this. First of all, to be able to see V-Ray settings, we need to have V-Ray chosen as the corona render. Let's start from V-Ray tab. Basically, we leave these options as they are. They give us the possibility to use V-Ray frame buffer instead of the frame buffer from 3ds Max. If we click here, the V-Ray frame buffer with the last preview will be opened. This option simply takes the resolution from 3ds Max common render settings. Here, we can directly write to disk the raw image data as it is being rendered. And this one allows us to save the channels from the VFB into separate files. So we can simply check it and choose the place where we want to save it. Next, global switches. Here, we can control different aspects of the renderer globally. So whatever we select here, it relates to everything in the scene. We can decide if we want V-Ray displacement mapping to work. We can uncheck this to speed up the rendering, for example, when we want to test only lighting. Lights, similarly, enables or disables lights globally. And hidden lights. When this option is enabled, lights are rendered regardless of whether they are hidden or not. It can be helpful from time to time. Override materials are really useful, especially when we set up the lighting at the beginning. We can choose the materials by clicking on None. We can also include exclude from the list, exclude layers, and exclude objects like this. It can be useful when we, for instance, want to have V-Ray basic material on all objects except the glass windows. We can go to advanced settings. Most of the time, the default settings work fine. We have adaptive light select. It's typically faster than other options. We can also use don't render the final render image if we want, for example, quickly render only the masks. We can go to the export settings as well, however, I'm not going to talk about all of this as these are not the most commonly used settings. Let's see what we have else. We can start interactive rendering by simply clicking here. The next one is one of these settings that can greatly impact the balance of render quality and speed. So basically, we have two options to choose. Now we have the progressive image sampler. So it progressively samples the entire image and refines the details over time. It's really good to use, for example, when we want to set a specific time of the rendering. Let's take a look what we can adjust here. We can render masks. Let's choose selected for instance, so now only selected objects will be rendered. Actually, let me show you. Let me select the light and I start interactive rendering. Now the box. Here we go. Cool, right? Ok, let me show you what we can set in the progressive image sampler. I leave this as default. So here, you can choose after what time the image will stop rendering. So if we type 5, it should stop after 5 minutes. If we type 60, after 1 hour and so on. However, we also have a noise threshold. Now, if there is a value higher than 0, the render stops whatever comes first, so the image will stop rendering after 60 minutes unless it reaches level of noise 0.01 first. If we want to render the final image this way, we need to set it to 0.005 or maybe 0.001 depending on the scene. If we set this to 0, the render stops after 60 minutes. If we have 0 in both examples, it will render indefinitely. 
If we have zero render time but 0.01 noise threshold, it stops after it reaches the noise level 0.01, and so on. We also have a bucket option here. As the name says, it renders the image in bucket, so the rectangular regions. The same as in the progressive, we can choose render masks. We have options here as well. We leave them most of the time as they are. However, if I render a high-res image, I lower this value down. We can adjust the noise threshold here as well. So for high-res, I would go the same as in the progressive, 0.005 or 0.001 for more demanding scenes. So this is how bucket works. It renders these rectangular regions as I said. I go back to the progressive as it's great for testing things. Ok, let's see what we have next. Basically, I leave it as default, but it is good to have a general idea what is it for. So the image filter sharpens or blurs the transition between adjacent pixel colors. First, I render the default settings. I save it in the history panel so we can compare it later. Now, I choose area. And I save it again. Actually, we can change size to 4, so it's even easier to see the difference. And maybe this one as well. So you can test different image filters. Ok, so let's compare. A is the default one. And B is area with size 4, so the edges are blurry. You can see it clearly here. And this one creates a total different effect. It makes the edges stronger. You can test different image filters to know how they affect the output. Image filtering is important when textures in the rendering include very fine details. Ok, what else is here? We'll leave global DMC as default. Now, environment. We can use it if we want to override the 3ds Max environment. So let's say I want to override the sky. We can use different maps. Let's say there is sky. We can change the color of the environment or intensity here. We can override other things the same way too. Color mapping. So basically, I use Reinhardt and adjust it by changing a burn value. Let me show you why. So I show you two other examples first. I choose a linear multiply. It's super bright. We can adjust it here a bit to see something. So you can notice that it causes bright parts of the image to appear and burned out. If we change type to exponential, the problem disappears, but it attempts to wash out the colors and desaturate, so it lacks contrast. And Reinhardt, which I use, is a blend between these two. So 0 means exponential, and 1 linear multiply, so we can set the burn value to, for example, 0.3. It will be closer to exponential, but still not so washed out. If we go for example 0.6, it's more like linear multiply, but not so burned out. And so on. We can start with value 0.4 for instance and adjust it when we have lights in the scene. Here, we can set camera settings, but we don't focus on this today. Ok, now let's go to GI tab. The global illumination tab is another thing that can influence the balance of render quality and speed. As default, the primary engine is set to brute force and secondary engine light cache. Primary specifies what method will be used for primary diffuse bounces. Brute force method recomposes GI values to every single shaded point separately and independently. This is a very accurate method and it's slow in comparison to others. It doesn't cause flickering in animation, for instance. Irradiance map instead compute GI only at some points in the scene and interpolate for the rest of the points. This method is fast, however it's not as detailed as brute force. 
Another important thing is that light mix doesn't work when the radiance map is set here. Light cache doesn't work well with bump maps, and I think I have never used it as a primary engine. We can adjust these settings as well. Typically, I use medium here and value 70 and 45. For the secondary engine, I always use light cache, I don't really change these settings. You can read more about the render settings on the Chaos Group website as they have everything described in details there. If you want to understand the idea of creating great visualizations and the workflow behind it, check out our visualization course for beginners. Click here to check it out on our website. Bye-bye!